Hello and welcome to another episode of Marty's Matchbox Makeovers. Coming to you, coming to you from Melbourne, Australia. Today I am making over this Matchbox number 37 Coca-Cola Lorry marks of the number 37. The 37A which has no base on it and the 37B which this one is and it has a base on it. 37Bs came out in 1960, the earlier ones came out in 1957. Now this one here has been modified by somebody, they've done a marvellous job on this front grille which kind of perplexes me as to why the rest of it looks so rubbish. This front wheel needs to be replaced. The base is held on with just one tab at the back here and you can't see it because there's so much paint on there and a kind of funky looking crimped piece of metal on the front. Now some of you may have noticed this vehicle before. This is a number 38. It's the Carrier Refuse Collector and they are based on the same model. If you can see the front end is exactly the same. So a little bit of trivia there for you. Here's one uh, of the earlier models that does not have the base. Just to show you the comparison, the differences in the models concerned. So I'm going to use this model here as a guide as to the color that I'm going to repaint this. First up, I've got to take the base off of this model. I'm just scoring the paint here with this craft knife. And I'm trying to expose the rear tab here to make it easier to pull apart. Because sometimes this paint, when they lather it on like this, it acts like glue. Now I'm not going to modify the front end here at all. I'm just going to prise it off. The metal is quite flexible and I have found in the past that you can prise these models apart and then force them back together and the metal reacts accordingly and retains the base back on it as you will see at the end of this video. Now these tires here are, I was hoping to reuse them but this one here in particular is cracked. This one here has been corroded by some chemical or ultraviolet light, who knows and another one on this side is cracked so I'm basically going to replace these wheels with new parts. Now I figured I had a, a big bag of these wheels and uh, looking at them I thought to myself well they look quite good. So I'll measure them up make sure they are the same diameter the plastic wheels that I've got here are 7mm and the originals are 7.5 so I'm a little bit disappointed that I can't use these plastic wheels that I've bought to replace these originals. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take these wheels off and I'm going to source some more wheels from a similar model and then I'm going to order some new ones so that in the near future I can replace the wheels on the other model which I am robbing the wheels off of. All sounds very confusing doesn't it? <laughs> I must admit I'm a bit confused myself. Anyway here we go. I'm grinding down these ends of these axles here using my Dremel with the rotary grinding stone. I'm very careful not to damage the tyres and here I'm having to use some pliers to pull these wheels off because they're quite a tight fit. So these are the wheels I'm going to use that I've robbed off of the other model. Now I've split this model in two, it's basically only two parts except for the wheels and axles, the base and the body. 
So I'm going to paint strip these now. It's sometimes a challenge to find a spot where I can hold the model with these forceps or hemostats as some people call them and enable me to strip the paint without handling the model itself. But usually I find a spot as I have done here and I'm now using the last of my paint stripper. I'm going to have to buy a new can of this now. I just spread it on with a spare paintbrush that I have specifically for this purpose and this paint stripper takes time to take effect sometimes longer than others in this case it took quite a quite a long time when I see the paint blistering it is time for me to take it into the sink area run it under some water and do my best to loosen the paint. Oh hi, didn't see you there. So now I'm giving it a hard rough scrub with a toothbrush like this and wow, check that out. This paint is just falling off this model. I'm really happy with that. <laughs> See, I'm wearing a rubber glove there. That's always good, especially when you're using the paint stripper. Now, this model here actually has a hole in it, which was concealed by the thick paint. But since I've removed the paint, it's now um, visible. So I'm going to have to fix that. On the face of it, this model was really going to be easy. But there's a lot of damage to the model itself. And it's all going to have to be repaired. Now to get this paint out of the corners here, I'm having to use a combination of wire brushes and toothpicks. And it's proving to be extremely awkward to strip this model down to the bare metal so I can undercoat it and repaint it. So again, I'm using another wire brush. And that's as good as I can get it at this stage. Now I turn my attention to the inside of the cabin where some of the paint has been left behind. So I just use this curved dental tool here to scrape the interior of the roof and remove this paint. No one will ever know that this paint was here but because I can see it it needs to be removed. I could not sleep easy tonight if I knew that this blistered paint was still remaining on the model. Not only the cabin but also the rear end here in the corners. And now I notice that this rear screen on the back of the truck is slightly bent. So using these pliers with paper tape I gently tease the rear end here back into position. Mindful that if I am overzealous, I could crack the casting. However, I don't need to apply heat in this instance, and it comes good. This metal is quite soft. Now I'm going to repair this hole using an old time proven method of super glue and baking powder. But before I do, I need to mask the area off to create like a small dam, if you will, into which I will put a pool of super glue. There you can see I have dammed off the hole that I'm going to fill. Now what I do is I just put a, a little tiny drop of super glue in that hole. It can't run anywhere because of the tape. And I give it a bit of a blast of some baking soda and just agitate it around so that it molds itself to the area concerned. And now you can see there that is a beautiful repair and I can reveal it here. I can take the tape off. Now you can see the outside. 
So this is a two part repair. First of all, I repaired the inside of the cabin. Now I'm going to repair the outside of the cabin, i.e. the roof. So once again, I used the super glue and baking powder, and now it is repaired both inside and outside. And it just needs a little bit of neatening up. Here you can see there's a bit of overflow in the windscreen area. So I just cut that off with this craft knife or exacto knife. Normally it's a little bit firmer than this. I think I might have gone a bit early. Anyway, it worked out in the end. And now this super glue and baking powder is solid. And it's that, that tough, that almost as tough as the metal itself. I can file away to grind it down to make it conform with the original profile of the model. Here I'm just putting, uh, using a square file to try and define the interior of the windscreen there. And I think you'll agree that repair looks quite good. Now, not only that, you can see now on the roof of the cabin, there is some damage caused by corrosion over the years. And I'm just going to fill it up with this Dynatron glazing and spot putty. This is the first time I'm using this and I'm quite pleased to see it can fill very, very minor imperfections in the model. I notice at this stage that there is a little protrusion here on the underside of the right hand side of the truck. So I just file it away with a small file. Uh, I guess it was left there from production. I notice this filler I'm using, one of the warnings on the tube itself says overexposure, <laughs> overexposure may affect hearing. So that's my excuse from now on if Julie calls me and I don't answer. I will say I'm overexposed to this putty. Now I just uh, sand this down with some very light emery paper there and uh, running my finger over it feels quite smooth. So I'm confident to go ahead and spray this with some undercoat. Of course the undercoat will reveal any areas that I've missed which is part of the reason why you do it. I've rounded off the rear end of the top there as well with a small file just to make it look neat. Now to undercoat this base there is nowhere where I can hold it with these forceps. So I'm using an old technique here I haven't used it for a while. Uh, I have to glue a screw, sometimes a small nail, onto the part that I want to hold because there is nothing to hold it by. But now I can put this in the spray booth and spray it and uh, I have full control over it which is quite a handy tip. I'm using this Tamiya Fine Primer Grey for this model. Well, that's the body and now the base. It's great having that screw glued on there. I can snap that off later and no one will be the wiser. Looking at this model, I can now see that there are areas that need extra attention. For example, here at the rear of the cabin, you can see the upper sign there has a divot or a dent in it. That needs to be filled. The front looks not bad. In fact, it actually looks really good. The doors are clear. You can see the door handles, etc. But there is a little uh, dent there at the top of the cab I missed. So I'm going to fill that and sand that down and respray it. And there's another, there's a couple of other bits and pieces there that I felt required extra attention. So I shall come back to that later. 
Now I'm showing you a little tip here. Using some tweezers, I am holding a small piece of folded emery paper. And where your fingers can't reach, I mean, I've got fat fingers myself, so this was really handy to sand down these tiny little areas. Now it's time to mix the paint. Now I'm using this other Matchbox Coca-Cola truck that I have as a guide to mixing the paint. And this model incidentally was donated by a W. Cruitt from Middleburg in Holland. So thank you W. Cruitt. Without you, I would be unable to match this paint. Now this paint here, straight out of the pot, the Lemon Yellow X8 from Tamiya, is pretty damn close. However, it's not exact. So I thought I would add a couple of drops of red from the Mr. Hobby range, the 327 there, just to try and make it a little tiny bit orangey. Initially I thought, wow, I've put too much red in there, but stirring it around, it does disappear and blend in. And now I think I've got the exact color. So I'm happy with that. I just thin it down with some thinners, <laughs> funnily enough. Always make sure that there's adequate ventilation in your spraying area. Just putting the paint now into the airbrush. Give it a test spray on the newspaper. Everything seems good, so I go full steam ahead. As usual, I give it a fine coat followed by a thick wet coat and I don't pause in between because the fine coat dries really quickly so by the time you've covered the vehicle with the fine coat it's ready to go with the thick coat to speed things up I put it in my little sandwich toaster to dry this paint so I can handle the model to reassemble it without leaving any fingerprints on it. Normally this would take one to two days. As for the base, I'm going to go with my favorite satin black. Spray it on. This is a real cheap paint from the $2 shop and it is surprisingly good. Now here's all the parts ready for assembly. So first up, I'm going to put the wheels on the base. So I go out to my shed to use my drill press for securing the wheels on the axles. And I'm gonna show you that now. So remember these wheels were robbed from another vehicle and I'm ordering some new ones for the other vehicle. I will do it up in the future and add it to my collection. But in the meantime, I wanted to show you this model. So I've taken the wheels off of it and I'm repurposing them here. Now, look at that, that is a perfect example of a mushroomed ended axle using this drill press method where I have two nails with cups drilled in them and they deform the end of the axle and retain those wheels on the model. And they, they spin quite freely too. I mean, look at that, you couldn't ask for anything better. Now I've placed the base back on the model, but it needs to be pressed home, if you will. So I've, uh, I'm experimenting here, I'm using a couple of wooden stirring sticks here. I give it one strike with the hammer, and yes, it is locked into place, which is great. So the base of this looks really original. Only one thing left is to put the decals on. 
I ordered these decals from recovertoy.com and they are very very good I've used them before this is not the first time I've done this model but it is the first time I've filmed it so to start with I just put a little bit of moisture on the model there and when I place the decal on it means that I have time to move the decal around to position it exactly where I want it and when the backing is uh, loosened I hold the image with my finger and I pull the backing sheet out and place the decal into position if it's not quite right I use extra water some cotton tips, some toothpicks, sometimes a paintbrush, just to move it into the correct position. When I'm happy with where it is, I then wick away the excess moisture using some kitchen towel squares like this. And just to ensure that it is in the correct position and glued down, I run over it with some little cotton buds there and I just rotate them as I go moving from the middle towards the outside to squeegee out any excess moisture or air bubbles that might be underneath the decal. So I've done the two top ones, now I'm doing the rear. Last thing is to add some silver detailing, i.e. the headlights, bump bar and front grille, which was silver on the original model. So I don't like to go over the top, I just try to recreate what was there originally. So I just dab this silver ink onto the model and very carefully blend it in. Some people use chrome. I don't like the chrome because when these Matchbox models came out, they didn't have chrome paint available. So I use this rather drab silver ink and it looks more natural. That's my reason for doing that. So here is the original model on the turntable. As you can see, the previous owner has painted it this mustard yellow. Well, this is what it looks like now. It's the correct color. It's got new wheels, new decals, a nice crisp painted front end with the drab silver ink to make it look original. And I think you'll agree, this is a cute little model with those crates of Coke in the back. It looks amazing. Now here are the other ones that I've done in the past but never filmed. The one in the middle has a partial load, it's not full. As you can see, some of the crates are missing. And this was the second version of this model. The orange one is the earlier model that came out in 1957. It has a partial load on the back of it, i.e. some of the crates are missing. That's what sets it apart. Also, it has no base. So I hope you've enjoyed this video on the restoration of the number 37B Coca-Cola truck. So me and Kevin were in the milk delivery business, but there was no profit in it. So we've gone into the soft drinks. Um, I don't know where he is. He was supposed to be back in two minutes. He was going to make a delivery to number 16 Kia Aura Drive. but uh, Where's he gotten to? Oh, he's, he's in the cabin. <coughs> Until next time, this is Marty from Marty's Matchbox Makeovers saying goodbye and thanks for watching. Mm -hmm. Ah, yeah. 
Mm -hmm. ah. <laughs> I was a bit worried about that. These <laughs> axles don't fit on this wheel. <laughs>